Welcome to FP&A Fast Track, your source for FP&A resources to put your career on the fast track. So welcome, everybody. I have a great guest with me on the show today, Mr. Gary Kokins, who is an internationally recognized expert, speaker, and author, enterprise and corporate performance management methods, and business analytics. He's the founder of Analytics-Based Performance Management, an advisory firm located in Cary, North Carolina, not too far from where I am. And his website is GaryKokins.com. We'll get into how to reach you and everything uh, at the end. He received his BS degree with honors in industrial engineering and operations research from Cornell University in 1971. Achieved his MBA from Northwestern University, Kellogg School of Management in 74. So as you can see, he's a real underachiever. And then began his career as a strategic planner with FMC Link Bell Corporation, then served as an FMC division financial controller and operations manager. In 1981, Gary began his management consulting career with Deloitte Consulting. Uh, my brother worked for them for a while. And then in 88, with KPMG Consulting. In 92, he headed the National Cost Management Consulting Services for Electronic Data Systems, EDS, now part of HP. From 97 till 2013, he was principal consultant with SAS, which a lot of you in the industry are very familiar with, their leading provider of business analytics software. So it was a long introduction, but Gary has a wealth of experience and knowledge, some of which we're going to get to have him share with us on today's show. So Gary, thank you very much for being here and welcome. My pleasure, John. Thanks for inviting me. So, um, one of the first things that I want to ask you is, I always like to start with a little bit of context. So obviously, I, I went through your background, but that's your professional background. I, I find it's always interesting to get a little bit of context on the person, not just the profession. So tell me a little bit about where you grew up. Well, I grew up in a very special western suburb of Chicago called Riverside, only 9,000 uh, population. It's just west of Berwyn and Cicero, Al Capone, Cicero, um, but near LaGrange, Hinsdale, uh, Downers Grove. But what's special about Riverside is it was the very first planned village in 1869 in the United States by the famous landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted. It was a wonderful place. If you ever do a little look at the map of it, uh, he didn't like grid pattern streets, so it's a spaghetti bowl. Still has <laughs> gas lights. Um, and so that was really special. I come from a working class family. I'm Greek American. My original name is Kokinos, obvious, it's an OS at the end. My mom and dad had uh, delicatessen bells, were Greeks in, in Riverside. And uh, we lived in a 1,400 square feet apartment above it. So uh, seven days a week, I worked weekends. And so that was, but that was good training for me how to interact with customers. That's what my mom and dad really ingrained in my brother and I. It's all about customers. And I'll make an analogy back to our business. To me, it's all about line managers getting better information from their CFOs and accountants. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. Yeah, definitely. So I always find it interesting to kind of try to connect the dots between where someone is now in their career and what did you want to be when you grew up? So when you were, let's say, a teenager, what, what was something that you wanted to be? And if there's more than one, I'd love to hear about that. Well, I was very mathematical. I love mathematics and, and logic. And so I kind of knew I was headed for some sort of engineering you know, program. Uh, I probably shouldn't say this. I had early acceptance at Purdue University. <laughs> However, then Cornell came in on a rich alumni. I played football and, uh, you know, he paid me visit Ithaca, New York. The Cornell campus is beautiful. Plus it's an Ivy League school. Plus I got a full ride. Yeah. So I said, uh, Cornfields in Lafayette, Indiana, I'm headed there. So, but the mathematics is really what led me. What was more interesting is the end of your sophomore year in engineering, you have to declare which program, chemical engineering, electrical engineering. I'm going, no, 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 no. But industrial engineering appealed to me because it's all about really scheduling and optimization and fixing things. And I, I kind of like that. Regarding a career, I currently 
I like to say to people, my career is over. It's now a, it's a vocation. And there's a difference. People listening to me probably have careers. You want salary increases, job promotions. But, you know, I'm 74. My career is over. The, my vocation is I want to make a difference. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about it. I'm very frustrated that the CFOs and the accountants, many of them are in the 1970s. And how do we get them into the 21st century? Mm, yeah, that's a great topic to go down. Um, let's start with one that you and I talked about uh, before we got rolling here, which was, uh, it's a question that I was asked by someone that completely stopped me in my tracks. And the question was simply, what do you know that I don't know that I wouldn't know if I didn't ask you? Oh, this is a two minute answer. So I'll be quick. I'll try to be quick. When I was eight or nine years old, I've made up a little game called dice baseball. Two's a homer, three's a double, you know, and so forth. And I kept records. I actually had teams play each other and I had like little box scores. So it was fun. My mom got worried, you know, that I was up there playing all summer long. And But I was my high school class president, so I, <laughs> I must have been okay. Fast forward, 19, uh, I'm 27 years old. I'm in Milwaukee. The Society of American Baseball Research, Saber, people may be familiar with it from the movie Moneyball. Moneyball. You know, uh, was, had their conference in Milwaukee. So I uh, basically uh, paid for the, the uh, subscription membership. But earlier in that, my junior year at Cornell, uh, I took a game theory course from a professor who actually programmed chess computers against the Russians. Um, and for my project, what I did is I replaced the dice from the baseball game with a random number generator. And I don't want to go too deeply into it, but, but you know, a big deck of cards took the entire semester to run it. I, and I finished the baseball game, the computer baseball game, uh, got an A plus. Now, fast forward, I'm listening with this uh, Sabre, uh, Society of American Baseball Research, you get a list serve where people put in their little messages. So I'm reading the message and this guy says, I'm in the baseball hall of fame for the oldest computer baseball game, 1972. And I said, you know, my computer program at Cornell was two years before that. So I wound up calling Cooperstown, New York. I get the receptionist. She says, let me put you in touch with James Gates, who's the curator and librarian baseball of him. Uh, he says, do you still have the program? I said, well, I'm the deck of cards, but I've got a copy of the printer and I'll mail it into you. I did about three weeks later, I get a phone call. He says, Gary, this is James Gates. I have good news. I'm in the Baseball Hall of Fame for the oldest computer baseball game. And I tell my grandsons, it's not like, you know, Charles Lindbergh or the Wright brothers, but given the size of the computer game industry, it's a pretty big honor for me. Well, it's pretty cool. It's nothing else. That is, that is really cool. So that, I, I love some of the responses that I get from that question because the reason it hit me and it stopped me in my tracks is I think most of us fall into patterns in conversation sometimes. So somebody says, hi, we reflexively say hi back, or they say, how you doing? We reflexively say great or good or something like that. And this is a question you can't really answer reflexively. And it always gets a really interesting response. Now, I can't think of another question I would have asked you that would have got that response because it's a blind spot question, right? I didn't know enough about you to be able to even formulate that question. So um, that kind of actually, uh, I want to step back for a second because one of the promises that I, that I make with this podcast is um, I talk generally about communication. I think any conversation, we can pull lessons about communication, even if it's how we're doing it badly and lessons we can learn, right? So one of the subtopics is context, which we already talked about briefly with getting some more of your background. Listening is one of the, the most critical communication skills and one that I personally need to continuously work on. So I'm curious, who is someone in your life that you feel like is a really good listener? Well, he's no longer living, but he was my mentor, Bob Bonsack. He was the partner at Deloitte who I worked for. And a mentors, very few people have had really mentors where he would spend time with me, um, teaching me, uh, learning. I was just a senior manager, you know, at the time. So he was a good listener. But he also taught me something else 
about in consulting. You know, and in my first few years, because I, you know, I had a good educational, quite frankly, I was I, maybe it was a little bit of a know-it-all. Um, and I, he turned me 180 degrees. He said, rather than show off what you know, the best thing you can do is ask good questions. People will recognize you by the types of questions you ask. And let me just sort of like segue from that. I believe today the best leaders and the best executives no longer have the best answers. They have the best questions because there's too much volatility, too much uncertainty, too much complexity for them to rely on their sixth sense or gut feel or the types of answers they had earlier in their career that got them promoted to the top. They need to basically create a culture for investigation and discovery uh, and and tolerance for making mistakes as long as you learn from the mistakes. So that's where some of my analytics, you know, having been with SAS, and you mentioned SAS, but to clarify the for the audience, SAS is actually 15,000 employees. It's the world's largest privately owned you know, software vendor. It is the 800-pound gorilla in the analytics space. So that kind of leads me back to the topic that you brought up before, which is, and I'll, I'll phrase it as a question, what is something in the industry that you think people are really getting wrong? Getting wrong. Getting wrong. Reluctance to use progressive methods. And okay. uh, in the management accounting field, which is really, well, I'm, my field is corporate performance management, which is really the integration of many methods. And we can talk about that later. And, and I'd like you maybe to ask me what's caused interest in corporate performance management. But um, it's much broader than just management accounting. I started with management accounting. And what I feel getting wrong, and I kind of said earlier, there are these modern methods. One of them is activity-based costing, which has a really bad reputation from the past. And I can, res I can explain what that was. The consultants and companies were making ABC systems too large, too complex. No one could understand them. And then they didn't work. People say, oh, it failed. Um, but there's still this hesitancy by CFOs, accountants, even actually it's in, in all of the line management to use progressive methods. And, and we can talk about what are the barriers and obstacles that explain that behavior, cause that behavior. Well, let's talk about what do you, cons some of these methods that, that fall into that overall umbrella of progressive methods. Well. If I could first start with why there's interest in these progressive methods, and then I can read you sure. the laundry list. Now, this doesn't take three or four minutes, you know, because I've got about eight or nine of them. The first one is executive frustration with strategy failure. You know, most executive teams are pretty good at formulating strategy, or they'll bring in a high-end consulting firm. Their frustration is failure to successfully implement the strategy. And there's a, some empirical evidence on this. The Chicago, um, I did mention I was raised in Chicago. Yeah, go Cubs, go Bears. <laughs> that uh, the the uh, executive recruiting firm Challenger Gray and Christmas in Chicago monitors the involuntary turnovers of CEOs in North America. It's been increasing every year, and I believe why is post Enron, you know, the tanking of Anderson Consulting was. Um, uh, made board of directors take their job far more seriously at, at, with governance. Um, and then, and a good example would be Carly Fiorini at Hewlett Packard. They gave her, you know, a couple of years to implement HP strategy. She didn't, they terminated her. Second reason is increased accountability. You know, today there's no place to hide, you know, managers and employees will be monitored. They will be measured. Doesn't necessarily mean their jobs are at risk but it could adversely impact their salary increases and job promotions. Three, rapid, more rapid decision-making. Unlike a few years ago, we could test and learn and have meetings and conference rooms. You know, today people are on the phone, go or no go, yes or no. They have to make a decision in near real time. Fourth, mistrust with the management accounting system. I mean, the reality is most managers do not trust the management accounting. And of course, the bane of it is cost allocations, overhead cost allocations, more properly referred to as indirect expense. The uh, the accountants, they're lazy, it's convenient, they spread overhead 
like butter across bread using cost allocation factors like number of labor hours, units produced, sales amount, headcount, full-time equivalent, square feet. None of those allocation factors reflect the unique consumption of the uh, um, expenses in the end-to-end -end processes and the activities belong to them. Activity-based cost resolves that. Another one, five, poor customer value management. You know, the reality is customers are the source of value, wealth, value wealth creation for shareholders and owners. The problem is most accountants and CFOs are not measuring customer profitability. They're stopping halfway down in the income statement at gross profit or service line, you know, profit in income. They're not including channel distribution expenses, marketing expenses, selling expenses, cost to serve. And when you get true customer profitability, it's shocking to most companies because they think, oh, our largest sales customer must automatically be our largest in profit. No. You know, because your largest customers may be highly demanding, for example, always changing delivery schedule, never buying standard, always special, always calling help desk, always returning goods. And when ABC, when it traces all that, you discover, what? They're not most profitable. In fact, they could even be unprofitable. And so the reason customer profitability information is needed is because what marketing and salespeople are asking is, which type of customer is more attractive to retain, to grow, to win back and acquire? Which types are not? Next, get ready for this, poor contentious budgeting. I believe that the annual budgeting process is broken. <laughs> there are probably cut people's attention, you know, but you know, it's out of date a couple of months after it's published, caves into the loudest voice, the strongest muscle, you know, veteran, you know, managers who are experts at sandbagging, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And uh, the way in which companies do budgeting with spreadsheet, you know, they give, you know, in other words, every manager fills out a spreadsheet January to December, you know, each line item, including rubber bands and paper clips, you know, and then you give it, someone consolidates the spreadsheets in the accounting department, you give it to the executives, they say, okay, but not enough. So all the managers change some of those numbers a little bit lower consolidate it back to the executives. They say, that's better, but not good enough. Up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Come on, you almost want the executives to answer what number did you want in the first place? But that would, yeah. tell, us their, that would tell us their aspirations. We want to know realistically. And I don't think there's enough time in this podcast to say there are, you can integrate these, and these corporate performance management methods to be much more of a replacement for the budget, but more importantly, rolling financial forecast since the budget's update. Real quick, two more dysfunctional supply chain management, which may not apply to many listening to me. You may be in the retail with consumers, but for those in the supply chain, the problem there is most customers view their suppliers as the enemy. You know, it's an adversarial relationship. You know, and if we can negotiate lower price in a customer, in a supplier, when we put them out of business, so what? You know, we can always get another supplier. That's got to stop. It needs to be a marriage. Supply chains are competing against other supply chains. And finally, the last one is, you know, unfulfilled return on investment promises from large ERP systems like Infor or SAP. You know, the problem there is if you ask the chief information officer or, you know, the director of IT, you know, two years after you've gone through the long journey of trying to impl or up implementing the ERP system, you ask them, how well do you think the ROI has met or exceeded what the software salesman sold you on two years ago? They'll be hard pressed to say, yes, you know, we went through a lot of effort here to get this thing calibrated and formulated and all that stuff. That does not mean you don't put in the ERP system, but what you do, what you, because it just produced data. What these corporate performance management methods do is it converts the data into information and that provides, if you will, the information for insights and making better decisions. Now, I know I'm going long, but let me quickly talk about corporate performance management. What it really is, it's not a single process. It's the integration of multiple methods. And here are some of the methods that are part of, and think of them like gears in a machine where they're meshed together. The first one is profitability reporting. I already mentioned how activity-based costing can resolve that or address that. The next is strategy maps and balance scorecard, out strategy deployment. You know, the tools from Professor Robert S. Kaplan, the guy that trained me on ABC with KPMG and Dr. David Norton, you know, helps basically with assigning KPIs and targets on KPIs to align the behavior 
of the employees with the strategy that resolves that thing about CEOs, you know, being terminated. Another is the process management tools, lean management, Six Sigma, quality management, and the like. That's the operation people. They pretty much don't care about strategic information. They don't really care, well, where do we make or lose money or how much they care about cycle time reduction, quality improvement, you know, and the like. Then comes the driver-based, capacity-sensitive driver-based rolling financial forecasts. You know, basically, you think of it as doing the budget more frequently. And the reason I said capacity sensitive, and this is where I like to say to accountants, you know, I'm, a, I'm, an, I'm an engineer masquerading as an accountant. You've got to think <laughs> like an industrial engineer. Why? Because when you're really doing this predictive view of the future, you know, I call it the windshield coming at you, you've got to do what's called capacity resource planning. So you've got to, you've got to label or, or determine how each resource is either fixed step fixed or variable. And most accountants are not really, you know, comfortable with that. You know, they're kind of like bean counters and not really bean growers, if you will. And then enterprise risk management, which is a whole other field, bringing the enterprise risk management community in. And then finally, another would really be, well, those are all the methods. And when you integrate them seamlessly, you get a lot of pop, more power and synergy than them in isolation. And one of the problems with many companies is they have some of the methods in, but they are in isolation. So you got profitability, pricing people, one part of the billing, risk management people, are the part of billing, process improvement, other part of the billing. You get more power when you integrate them and even more when you embed analytics of all flavors into each of them. Examples of analytics, regression, correlation, segmentation, clustering, association. And I know many of the people listening to this podcast said, oh, Gary, I took those courses in college, I just wanted a passing grade and get the hell out of there. Well, sorry, you know, it's here, big data, analytics. But the good news, if you're listening to me, you don't need to go to your attic or basement, dig out your textbook, but you de do need skill sets, people with skill sets in analytics. So that was my probably three or four minutes on why interest in corporate performance management and what are the methods that are in it. So many questions. <laughs> All right, there are a few things I want to unpack. Yeah. Um, but first, I, I want to start with you mentioned um, uh, not enough focus on you mentioned KPIs and a lack of focus on certain things. I, I'm wondering, in your experience, I hear a lot more conversations about certain specific metrics in smaller organizations than I do in larger organizations. So, for example, understanding knowing customer acquisition costs and lifetime customer value. When I worked in corporate fp and I don't remember having long conversations about those metrics, those numbers, right? Um, is that something that you feel like executives today talk about more frequently or have more focus on than in the past? Yeah. I mean, you know, measurements is now pretty much universal, but the real message is measure what matters. And, you know, with some organizations, if it moves, they measure it. Um, yeah. One of the problems, if I could return back to the balance scorecard and strategy map, because I, I am mm -hmm. partly retired, but I help companies implement ac activity-based costing and strategy maps. But I, I do it through a workshop. So they have their strategy map and scorecard in one day. They have their ABC system in three weeks as I use a rapid prototyping method. Returning to the strategy map, in it, with its four perspectives, and if people are not familiar with it, you know, do a Google search and, you know, learn just a little bit about the four perspectives, learning and growth to process to customer to financial. And in each of those perspectives are strategic objectives. When you do this sort of discipline method of developing that kind of scheme, if you will, for each of the strategic objectives, the next step is what's a project or initiative that'll accomplish it, or in some case, a core process that'll we need to improve. And once you've done that second step, the third step is what would be a metric that we could monitor uh, the progress. So the definition of a KPI, because I want to contrast it with an OPI, operational performance indicator. The reason I want to do this contrast is in my experience, I've met some companies that implemented Kaplan and Norton. And I said, well, how many KPIs are in your balance card? Oh, 150. I went, oh, that's great. How can they all be a K? You can't have 150 key. So the definition of a KPI is monitoring the progress toward 
accomplishing the strategic objectives because its purpose is strategy execution. Remember the issue about executives, the in involuntary turnover of CEOs. Mm. Now, operational indicators, they're all measures, they're all important, but they are much more, if you will, process, cycle time reduction, customer satisfaction, and the like. So we need to be careful to limit our KPIs, I always say two to three per strategic objective. If you've got three strategic objectives, the poor perspective, that's 12, 12 times two, 24 KPIs max, because its purpose is strategy execution. If you want to have 50 or 100 other things to measure, have at it. That's good. You know, there'll be feedback there, but those are more for control as opposed to strategy execution. So, a couple of things that popped up for me as you were talking about this was you mentioned KPIs versus OPIs, which brings up a topic that our mutual friend, Ben Lamore talks a lot about OKRs. I had him on the podcast um, a couple months ago. Um, so, and what you were talking about reminds me too of when I've seen clients say, oh, well, here's our dashboard. And they pull out a little, it looks like a, like a book. Right. I'm going, no, that's not a dashboard. <laughs> by, by, by definition, if you know, if you got to keep flipping pages, it's not really a dashboard, right? And it's kind of the same thing you were talking about with the KPIs. Um, so uh, another thing that as you were talking about the ERPs, I, I'm curious to get your thoughts on what I sometimes refer to as the combo combo platter problem, right? Which is anytime in my personal life experience, anytime I bought a combo anything, right? It could be combo tool, you know, like a multi-tool or a piece of software that does five different things, it tends to do all of them okay, but none of them great, right? And it, it feels to me like all the ERPs and all of the systems that I've had personal experience playing around with, they tend to have one or two tools or areas of focus that they're pretty good in. And the rest of them, they're kind of they check the boxes, they do okay, but they're not really great at anything. What are your thoughts on that problem? But the fact that a lot of companies still want to have an ERP that kind of does everything. When you mentioned it, I thought of the Swiss army knife, you know, the tool yeah. that's got all the different things where, you know, a really bold screwdriver, screwdriver would be better than- I a joke. I joke all the time that we use Excel like a Swiss army knife in finance <laughs> and accounting, right? Oh, yeah. I'm going to do a calendar with it because because it can, because I can make yeah. it do that. Well, the thing that bothers me is um, not only, well, the ERP software vendors, you know, having worked for a software vendor for 16 years with SaaS, you know, there's releases, you know, periodically. And, you know, they've gone of quite a distance from way back when it was, you know, MRP and pretty much just, you know, reporting transactional stuff to start even including some sort of analytics and stuff. But like, you know, this is, but what bothers me is even the FP&A software vendors, and they are basically, think of that, maybe that's a part of an ERP system, because the ERP system is really a business planning and operational, you know, forecasting, production and inventory control for manufacturers and similar stuff for service organizations. And I'm not going to name the names of the FP&A software, but there's about 10 of them. You know, when I ask them, how well do you do activity-based costing? Um, they kind of say, well, we have a cost allocation engine and it's typically a step-down allocation, which doesn't have the cause and effect relationship of drivers. And the reason I'm concerned about that is when you do the forecasting to get to, you know, rolling financial forecasts to get to pro forma income statements and balance sheets, which what's the next step, net cash flow, which was of high interest to, to board, board members during the COVID because they wanted to know what's going to happen to this company that I got governance. You need unit level cost consumption rates. I'm going to talk industrial engineering here to do this forward looking thing because you, you've got to multiply the volume and mix forecast times the unit level rates to solve for the number of type of employees and purchases with suppliers, all that stuff. So for an FP&A, software vendor to say, P, we're doing the planning, but they don't have the unit level cost consumption rates, which are a fallout bonus from the ABC system, then you really can't do valid planning because you're not really doing resource capacity management. Now, 
a solution to that is there's a lot of, if you will, special software vendors like activity-based costing. I'm involved with about 10 of them. In fact, I want to just point out my fingers pointing profitability center of excellence. I'm, I'm one of the directors with it. It's a not-for-profit. Um, and we have some interest groups. So one of our interest groups is 10 ABC software vendors. And we have meetings with them. And it's really interesting because they're all competitors. But we talked them into having these meetings. And we said, look, this isn't about fighting over the slice of the pie. This is how can you grow the pie the so pie. that all of you can make some money. So um, the point is, these little tools, or they're not little, um, are really very useful. And at some point, the FP&A software vendors may you know, expand these offerings, but currently... I don't, I'm not seeing it. So one of the things that, that you talked about, one of your nine, I'll call them pillars. I don't know if it, that's how you refer to them. They're, they're causes. Causes. And pre she, forces she, and pressure. Yeah. She mentioned executive frustration with strategy implementation. In your opinion, what are some of the, the primary causes uh, when you look at it kind of across the board that, that seem to be common? Um, frustrations with strategy implementations? A couple of things. One, failure to communicate strategy to managers and employees in a way they can understand it. I mean, just for example, hypothetically, if I went into any organization and randomly interviewed 10 employees in the hallway and said, quick, two minutes, can you articulate your executive team strategy, mission, and vision? How many of the 10 could do it? Probably none, you know? So if they can't understand the strategy, mission, and vision of the executives, how do we expect them to understand what they do each day, each week, and the decisions they make contributes to the strategy? The second, I think, observation is executives have too much emphasis on financial reporting reported at the end of the fiscal period. And what Kaplan and Norton, when they actually designed or created the strategy map, they were addressing that by saying, you need to shift your attention to non-financial metrics collected and reporting during the period so you can take corrective actions and start making changes. And so now we're back to the KPIs. So getting you know, getting back to the drivers. And they, and they are still strategic KPIs, but many of the KPIs, you know, the fourth perspective in Kaplan Norton, that's the whole, you know, EBITDA, profit and stuff. The other three perspectives, those are non-financial metrics. And so measuring the right things is really the key. And then, you know, I went to my forces, holding managers accountable for the targets that the executives will put on the KPIs. Now, that's a whole other issue. The executives got to be careful. If they create targets that are unachievable, you know, they're going to alienate their managers. That's impossible, you know. So targets need to be, you know, good enough that a manager, you know, every day, every week, when they look at their um, their scorecards, not dashboards, there's a difference. Um, they can see, am I favorable or unfavorable to the target? How much, how do I, what changes do I make to meet that target? So this is really, and we should talk about this, John, there's much more behavior. You know, these are not necessarily mechanical tools. These are social tools. Yeah, but that's actually... Uh, the the word I wrote down with question marks after it, as you were talking about this, was culture, right? The, these these failed communications. How much of that is because of some of the culture? I just had a a call related to a training that I'm going to do. We were talking about. I was asking the client when we do the training. I always try to tailor as much as possible of the things on the agenda. Um, do any of these jump out at you as being particular concerns that maybe we could focus on more? And culture was one of them they talked about where there, there are certain aspects of culture, some of it that's within the company, company culture, some of it that has more to do with they have people in different countries. So you have company culture coming in and they all have an impact on communication. And when we start to dig in these conversations, sometimes what I find is a commonality is that it's never... It's almost, it's almost like a dirty little secret. Like nobody wants to talk about it because one of the reasons I think is no one has any solutions, right? And I, I kind of was always taught in my corporate life, don't come to me with a problem unless you have 
a, a solution in mind, or at least a proposed solution that we can at least run up the flagpole and give a try. So I'm, I'm curious on your thoughts on how much culture fac factors into that and what, what types of things you've seen implemented that, that might be helpful in that regard. Let me uh, answer that and include culture with a little broader answer. And I, I'm going to sort of segue back to something I said earlier that, you know, many of this humorously, the CFOs encounter in the 1970s, how do we get them to the 21st century? You know, the problem there is what I call the imbalance. You know, many of their focus is external statutory financial reporting for the SEC, IRS, government agencies. You know, not enough on management accounting, which would include activity-based costing, lean accounting, you know, and the like. But I mentioned that my frustration is the slow adoption rate. What's taking so long for these organizations to basically implement and embrace these? And I start with the first one, and it's got nothing to do with technology or software or systems. It's all about people. And it starts with resistance to change. You know, it's human, human nature. People like the status quo. I like to say, oh, babies like change of diapers. But there's some other social barriers. There's fear of others knowing the truth. Oh, I don't want the other departments to know what my cost. There's fear of being measured. There's fear of being held accountable. Um, and then I'll say it, there's weak leadership. You know, not every organization's executives have the highest IQ. So to, to really successfully implement these, you need some behavioral change management skills. And you know, I do a lot of seminars or conferences for state CPA societies because the CPA has got to get their CPA. You know, and I asked them at this point, raise your hand. How many of you have undergraduate degrees in sociology or psychology? None. You know, you're all what I call Newtonians, you know, like Isaac Newton. Do you? The world's a big machine. Give me the levers, pulleys, dials. I said, you need to have a little bit of Darwinian, Charles Darwin, you know, sense and respond, you know, to, to these things. Now, you ask what can be done to sort of mitigate it, um, or if you will create this change, first, you've got to have leadership. The problem with leadership is many leaders, I would like to say, don't have followers. You know, a leader without followers is just taking a walk in the park. You know, in my yeah. mind, by my mind, there's difference between leaders and managers. Managers, you know, spreadsheets, work charts, budgets, all of that stuff, you know. What leaders require, I think, two things, vision and inspiration. And so that inspiration to get people to follow them, you know, and that's going to come through the communications. And this is going to be part of, of the cultural thing. But if I could just elaborate, I've been using for the last 15 years to advise people, how do you create change? How do you overcome resistance? Which is, here's the formula. People may want to write it down. D times V times F is greater than R. D as in dog, V as in Victor, times F as in Frank is greater than R. R is resistance to big numbers. So everybody should be asking, what's D, V, and F? But before I tell you, if any of them are zero, those three are very small, the left side of the formula is not going to overcome. So you need all three in abundance. All right, what are they? D stands for discomfort with the current state. Unless people have some sort of unhappiness, they ain't interested in changing. V stands for a vision of what better looks like. So if they've got big D, discomfort, they're looking for the lifeline or the lifeboat, you know, and that's where the corporate performance management solutions come in. But you would like to think, well, if they got big pain, big D, discomfort, and you've got the solutions, we're home free to overcome the resistance. No, F is the sleeper. F stands for first practical steps, because if they think your solution is impractical, overly theoretical, unaffordable, they're not going to go anywhere. So to kind of bring this kind of like close the loop on this, the experiences in my life, and I sort of mentioned this earlier, is it's key to recant is to ask pain questions of people that have decision making authority. Now you got to be careful, could be career limiting, because if you start asking the CEO questions like, does everybody understand the strategy? Are we measuring the right things? Do we know where we make or lose money? Do we know which customers are more or less profitable? And that's just four of about 50 questions you could ask. You know, you're creating that discomfort. Now, if the CEO or the executives basically are like, hey, this guy or woman's and you're a problem, well, let's go terminate them. You know, be careful. But if you can create that discomfort 
through pain questions, you're leading the horse to water because they're saying, well, oh, we don't know where we make or lose money. How do we do that? Activity-based costing. We're not sure we're measuring the right things. How would we do that? Strategy map and balance scorecard. So you lead them to the solutions. And the first practical steps I mentioned, rapid prototyping with iterative remodeling. And if people want to communicate with me or their intro, I am partly retired, but I do provide advice. Actually, I like to do knowledge transfer, kind of train the trainer uh, how to implement an ABC system in three weeks or strategy map, balance scorecard, a couple of days. Long answer to your short question. <laughs> it was a great answer, though. And it, you reminded me uh, when you said, you know, ask those pain inducing questions and, excuse me, and they could be what we used to refer to as a CLM, a career limiting move. It reminded me of a story a friend of mine told me when he started as CEO of a new company and he had a team meeting and they were going through the distribution list of all these financial reports they were sending out, internal uh, management reports. And he started asking them, well, who uses it? What do they use it for? And he was getting back a lot of I don't knows. And he said, all right, well, one of the first thing that I want to do, I want to make a list of, of some of these reports that we're sending out that nobody seems to know, you know what they're being used for. I want to stop sending them out and let's wait and see who complains and then ask them what they're using them for. That's a great example of a strategy that had some sound thinking behind it, but he had to have the bravery, for, for lack of a better term, to make that move. Now, as a CFO, I, I, I guess he was in a position where he felt comfortable he could do that. But sometimes that could be a CLM if you're in the wrong culture or you don't have the relationship with the, the C-level executives around you to say, hey, we got your back on this. We understand where you're going with the strategy. Um, but I've, I've brought that up in conversations with some people and they've been like, are you out of your mind? That's crazy. I, I, I would never do that. And it's that fear that you're talking about, uh, stopping them from a lot of that. So the questions, questions are, it's one of the biggest areas of opportunity, I think, for myself, not just as someone who has a podcast who, who interviews people, but also in every other thing about life. I, and not to get too overly philosophical, but you know, a lot of, there's a lot of philosophy centered around the whole idea that questions are the answer, right? I'm sure there's multiple books that have that somewhere in their title, but the quality of the questions that we ask to a great degree determine the level of success that we have, I think. Um, and I have two books. They're, they're sitting right uh, over there on, on a little uh, side table, specifically on decision-making. And it's something when I've asked people, sometimes in training, sometimes just in conversations, well, what type of decision-making processes do you use? And what I typically find is the vast majority of people have absolutely no structured, systematic ways of making decisions. And then I'll ask a follow-up question. Well, how do you decide if you made a good decision? And most people who have no background in decision science will say, results. I don't care about anything but the results. And then I'll bring up the classic example. What about if somebody, let's say you came to my house for a party and you had a few too many drinks, you got in your car and you drove home. I think most of us would agree right off the bat, bad idea, bad decision, right? But then that guy gets home, goes to sleep, wakes up the next morning, thinks, you know, I feel pretty good. I got home okay. Nobody got hurt. Yeah, maybe I wasn't as drunk as I thought I was. Maybe I'm a better driver than I think I was. And based on the result says, you know what? That was a good decision to drive home. And again, I think we could all agree, bad decision, good outcome. You got home safe. But how many times in our business life do we have that type of experience where we only look at the result and we don't look at our decision-making process? Is, is any of the work that you do working with people on decision-making processes, structures, any, anything along those lines? First, I'm glad you bring up decision because uh, to me, in the end, it's all about decisions, you know, but you've got to work backwards with the end in mind. The decision, mm -hmm. you know, where you really start is you got raw data to reporting to, you know, a little bit of drill down business intelligence stuff, you know, to 
you know, descriptive modeling, meaning re, re, last month reports to the predictive, you know, view, budgeting, forecasting, and like. And so if you can imagine, there's an exponential curve. This is the return on investment from information. Think of the ROI on information, you know. And I think there's a shift from the ROI on tangible assets like buying trucks or machines or hardware to the ROI and information. So it's an exponential curve. The problem is many organizations are stuck in just those first two stages, raw data and standard reports. All they can answer is what happened, you know? Mm. Even when they get some sort of drill down software from their IT director like Python or R or Alterx or SAS, my vendor or Power BI for Microsoft, they're still limited to just answering what happened. It's not till we move into the corporate performance management methods that I started to describe you know, that we can answer why did it happen? Because we have causality factors there. Activity-based costing is all based on cause and effect relationship, not this butter spreading thing, you know? So that leads us to what are the options? What are the types of decisions we could make? Then if you're familiar with, there's actually a continuum stages of maturity of analytics that at the top is prescriptive analytics. It's uh, optimization. And you may know, I wrote a book co-authored a book 10 years ago called Predictive Business Analytics. I thought, oh, that's Mount Everest. That's as high as it could go. Then all of a sudden prescriptive, you know, took us, but that's okay. So that's, I think that's the, the, how you work backwards with the type of decisions. Now, in terms of results, I think that is, you know, there's always these ROI questions. I'm a little uncomfortable with that, but I think when you are making the decision, there should be some sort of list of how will we determine three months from now, six months from now, 12 months from now, the impact. Think of it as the impact of making that decision. And, you know, that's where metric will come, metrics will come into play. Yes, I, I totally agree. We always have to kind of reverse engineer, right? What's the desired outcome? Um, but one of the examples that I, I have used to uh, another sort of way to make the point I way back in the day when they were the 10 ton gorilla, I worked at Blockbuster in mergers and acquisitions back in the early 90s. And at one point, Blockbuster was approached by Netflix. Netflix was proposing that Blockbuster buy them for, I think at the time, it was like $50 million, right? And the story goes, they got laughed out of the room, right? We all know now, but Blockbuster to most people is just a story we tell. And some people, you know, never had the experience of renting something at Blockbuster. But I, I bring that up sometimes because if I ask people, does it seem like Blockbuster made a big, bad decision, like a really stupid decision in not buying Netflix? And most people will just immediately reflexively say, well, of course, look at, look at Netflix now. But what information did they have? What, what did they know at the time that they were using to make their decision? And I, I like using that example because it's old enough that most people haven't got a clue what knowledge those people had, what was going on in the business environment, where was Netflix at that time, where was Blockbuster, what was the competitive environment. They have no context other than, well, the result is Blockbuster's gone and Netflix is, is huge. So in hindsight, it seems like they were bozos. But do we really know? I worked at Blockbuster and I couldn't tell you because I wasn't in the room. And I didn't work there anymore at that point. There are so many of these things that without understanding the parameters of what people had to make that decision and the constraints that they had, we can't even judge from the outside sometimes if it was really a good decision or a bad decision. Mm -hmm. um, but not to get too, too far down that rabbit hole. And I want to respect your time. We're, we're about at the, the time slot that we had talked about. Um, we, can I do wanna... we, can, we can go further. I've been, I'm enjoying okay. this. Great, great. Um, so there is a question, and I have it on a piece of paper here, but I'm not going to search for it. I think you know the question. Um, I think it's a Peter Thiel quote. It's something, something along the lines, and I'm paraphrasing, that um, we we tend to we tend to question everything except for our beliefs, and the beliefs that we we really hold strongly, we tend to never question. So I'm curious, what are, what, let's just pick one so, so we don't go too, too broad. What is one belief that somewhere along the way in your career or your life that you realized was wrong or not serving you 
that once you let go of that belief and adopted a new belief, things it, it led to some kind of an improvement. Well, I am kind of referenced this uh, during this interview. Um, it was earlier in my career, I think I said, kind of behaving like a know-it-all. Oh, I know the answers. I've implemented this, you know. And it was Bob Bonsack, my mentor, who basically said, you need to do a 180 degrees on this. It's not about, you know, the belief that the if you demonstrate to people how competent you are and how skilled you are and how knowledge on you are, you know, they're going to basically buy your services or, you know, follow you. It's turn it around and just ask those salient questions, you know. So, it, so I, I think my belief better was, oh, I've got these degrees and I've got all this stuff. My belief was I'm a star or I'm, you know, I can help. I know I could help, but the way in which I'm going to help, I've got to do it in an indirect way by, you know, communication, hearing that, being a listener, the things that you talked about, you know, earlier. You know, like I said earlier, there's so much social aspects to any organization. It, you know, it isn't about spreadsheets and numbers and matter. I mean, that's a part of it. You got to have the facts. But although here's a phrase I often use. In the absence of facts, anybody's opinion is a good one. I'm going to repeat that. In the absence of facts, anybody's opinion is a good one. But usually the biggest opinion wins, which is the opinion of the boss or the boss of the boss. So, you know, to the degree they're making decisions on gut feel or intuition or their third or so called sixth sense, you know, any organization is going to be at risk. And let me come back to Blockbuster. Um, I can't remember, I have them in some of my presentation slides, but I think of the original S&P 500, only 74 have survived. And of the actual Forbes 100, I think only 15 have survived. And so Toys R Us, Blockbuster, you know, I think the issue there is when a company or an organ, well, it could be a company is successful, they think they can ride on their laurels, but you know, each new month, each new quarter is a new day. And so you've got these competitors coming in. I mean, look at look at Amazon. You know, they started as a book publisher and now they're invading, you know, the television networks with, with streaming as an example. Um, so you can't rest on your laurels. <laughs> yeah. So to follow up on that, um, you said something about questions. And I, I know I... I listen to a lot of Tony Robbins stuff. I'm a big fan of his. And he's very big on questions, especially questions we ask ourselves. So I'm curious if there are any particular questions that you've asked yourself that stand out that have made you kind of look at something differently and led to maybe an aha moment, a paradigm shift in how you did something or how you thought about something. And I, yeah, you know, it's a life balance question. I mean, mm -hmm. I, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life, you know, and that's me. But I also have a wife, my rock, Pam, 30 years. And I think earlier in the marriage, you know, I, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. I loved working. But Somewhere along the line, she got my attention to say, there's more than work to love. And I'll just sort of leave it at there. That was sort of my aha, you know, and now I've got grandsons, 20 and 22. And I'm from a very large Greek family. My, my dad was the youngest of nine. I keep the family tree. There's 62 living descendants from Achilles Kokinos from Greece. Uh, so things like family. High school, golly, um, I met, I think I mentioned I was my high school class president, but I help organize our class reunions every five years. Those are wonderful. You know, and maybe let me, we could maybe start winding down by my saying this. Um, I think the best things in life are not things. They are relationships, whether it's, you know, friends from that you grew up with or relatives. So. Um, Maybe that was the transition I made. Thank you, Pam, for kind of like nudging me. 
Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And it's funny, as you were saying that, I thought of two sort of completely unrelated things, which is uh, my girlfriend and how she's shifted my mindset on that. Before I met her, uh, I've taken more vacations since I've been with her about six years than I took my entire life prior to that. And it's not like we've been on this vacation spree. I just never took vacation like at all. I had like two vacations in, in my entire career before that because I just had this mindset. I worked in these high performance environments where everybody worked, you know, till seven, eight o'clock at night, Monday through Friday. We were always in the office on Saturday. We traveled all the time. And so that was one thing that you, you made me think about. And the other thing was you mentioned your mentor, a mentor of mine from way back in the blockbuster days, Bill Flaherty, who I'm trying to get on the podcast. He agreed to it, but then he watched some clips and he said, well, I don't have my stuff to get. Bill, you have your stuff together. You have a great story. You've got to come on here. He's a guy that so early in my career, I was only a couple of years out of college. And every day I'd be like, what am I doing here? Like, I just had a bachelor's degree in accounting and like almost everybody had an MBA and, you know, the Wharton and Princeton and Harvard and. And here I was, this Florida State University, you know, bachelor of science guy. And Bill immediately recognized my strength was people. But I was a little weaker in some of the technical areas. And he literally took me under his wing. And once a week for a block of time, he bought me lunch, brought me into his office, and basically kind of tutored me on some of the technical stuff that he felt like I needed to, to get better at. And I'll never forget that. And I, I don't have it where I can grab it right now, but I still to this day have the business card. When I left Blockbuster, I said, is, is there any advice you can give me to, you know, to kind of take with me? And he took out his business card and on the back of it, he wrote the word structure. And I still have that business card. And I still think about that when I think kind of big picture career. And then when I get distracted with things and I find myself like a, like a, an octopus on roller skates going in a bunch of different directions, but it all comes back to people and relationships. And that's really where, when I look around my office here, back in the day, my office used to be nothing but these things, deal cubes. From when I worked in m and deals that we worked on back in the block, I just had my whole wall was just covered in these things. And now if you look around my office, it's all pictures of family and friends and stuff we did in memories. And so I think that was a great transition. I think it's a great way to wrap up. I would love to have you back on because I could talk to you all day. And there's so many things just in, in the first answer you gave to my first question. I've got probably two and a half pages of notes of questions that, that we could talk about um, down the road. So uh, with that, I want to I want to respect your time. I want to go ahead and wrap up. How can people get a hold of you? What is the best way to get a hold? Well, before I do, just I'm going to have my concluding remark. And it's back Absolutely. to the decision, the decision making. My favorite, one of my favorite phrases is, "In the land of the blind, the one eyed man, one -eyed is, man is king," <laughs> and or maybe king and queen. You know, so if you don't have the information to have the insights. You know, um, my website is www.garycokins.com, G-A-R-Y, C as in clock, O-K-I-N-S. Uh, my email address is gcokins at garycokins.com. And anybody's, oh, well, you can probably see my spelling there, the name and yep. the, the Zoom thing. And people are more than welcome to invite me in LinkedIn. But if you do, if you could do the optional message, you know, I listened to John Sanchez's podcast with you. So I kind of like know, uh, you know, who's this and why are they inviting me to connect? So a little, little context is always good. Yeah. All right. Well, great, Gary. I really appreciate your time. I enjoyed the conversation. We will have to do this again. And with that, I'll go ahead and wrap up and we will see you guys next time.